Welcome to the Thrive TV Show with Lauren Parsons, helping you boost your health, energy, and productivity. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Thrive TV Show. I'm Lauren Parsons, your host, and today I'm joined by Robin Gargano, who's coming to us all the way from Palm Beach Gardens in the US. Welcome, Robin. Hi, Lauren. Thanks so much for having me today. It is so lovely. I can't wait to hear your story and your wisdom and hear these examples because I think resilience is something that we all need more of right now. And today we're talking about the beauty in tragedy and looking forward to sharing some of your amazing story and and your unique view on life. I know it's going to be really inspiring. So we're talking about why pain is the ultimate power of life how being authentic and vulnerable sets you free from your inner prison and why grief and suffering are necessary to harness resilience. So thank you for sharing this with us. Before we dive into that, Robin, can I just ask you my this and that questions? Of course, I'm ready. Let's go. (laughs) Okay, so tell me, cats or dogs? Both. I have both. (laughs) Nice, lovely. (laughs) I can't choose. (laughs) Tea or coffee? Uh, Coffee. Okay. Okay. Sunrise or sunset? Sunrise. Nice. Spots or stripes? Mm, Stripes. Okay. A month without your car or a month without the internet? Oh, a month without the internet. (laughs) Nice. Singing or dancing? Singing. Okay. And last one, classic clothes or trendsetter? Ooh, trendsetter. (laughs) Okay, nice. So Robin Gargano is a resiliency transition coach and strategist. She's a best-selling author, impact speaker, proud mama, soul partner, and has been featured on media platforms like New York Weekly, Half Mag, Yahoo, and International News Broadcasts. After living in the darkness from multiple tragedies, Robin is driven to help those stuck in suffering to find their resiliency by harnessing vulnerability to find strength. After being a successful entrepreneur in the event planning space for over a decade, Robin is now the CEO of L4, Living Life, Loving Life, where she helps turn suffering into strength through resiliency training. So it's so great to have you here. Robin, can you start by telling us a bit about how did you get into what it is that you are doing now? Yes, absolutely. So how I am in this line of work right now comes from the story of life, really. And I'll laser focus this story, uh, but it really starts all the way back from, from birth. So I was adopted from birth. My brother and I both adopted. We had a wonderful childhood growing up. When I went to college, I met my husband and we tried to have children for a very long, I mean, it felt like eons really, but it was for almost a decade and we suffered seven miscarriages and we didn't have a real plan for that. We didn't really understand what infertility was, how to maneuver it. So we just kind of went and I've learned that's not the way to do things when it comes to something like that. Mm. And because of that, because of all of the grief, that we really sort of overlooked. We just kept pushing forward and going, never really stopping to grieve along the way. We Mm. had a separation and it was a short separation, but within that time, it was enough time to sort of reflect and become aware, take a breath. And as he is traveling back uh, from a work trip across the country, he gives me a phone call one day and says, you know what? I think it's time for us to come back together. Let's try to work on things. And I agreed. And the second night after that, he was traveling back and he had passed away in a plane crash. So that took my entire world in a complete different direction. As you pointed out, I was an event planner at that time and my world just stopped. It went black, depression, Mm -hmm complete, just darkness, emotions I had never felt before. Couldn't get myself off the floor, bawling in a closet, not eating, not sleeping. It's, it's when everything changed, my cognitive function changed. I couldn't do certain things. I couldn't think straight. I mean, speaking like this, forming sentences didn't really happen. Well, Um, words that I would use all the time, completely gone. So as I'm working through what that means, what grief is, trying to understand life and how to reintegrate into life, it takes a process. It's a long time. Grief is a lifelong journey. It's something that never ends. You learn how to ebb and flow with it and 
attack the emotions as they come. And when I say attack them, it's not attack them in a bad way, but take them in, really feel them, really understand them. And that's when I started this journey of discovery, healing. I did energy healing, acupuncture. I studied resiliency. I studied grief. I read, couldn't even tell you how many books I read, really dug therapy, countless hours of therapy and just work, self-development work. And fast forward, my brother, who is also my best friend, was a recovering substance abuser. And at the time he had lived in Idaho, decided to move back to Florida. He had had a baby girl. And when they moved back to Florida, he was here for a month with that baby girl. Her name is Isabella. And he had passed away in his sleep. And so the world went upside down again. This time a little bit different because we'd been through this, you know, major shift with losing children, then life or what life could have been changed completely. And now my brother, I went into mom mode. I was Isabella's guardian at the time. And how do I be strong? How do I do this losing my brother? Well, at the same time, my brother's girlfriend was pregnant. There was a last, you know, coming together wow. before he moved and she was pregnant and she was originally his sponsor and was not a sponsor. And so she was a opioid abuser. And so when the second child was born, my brother had already passed. I flew out to Idaho, got emergency custody of her. And we spent 17 days in the NICU as she withdrew on a Q4 morphine drip and detoxed, which was just a heartbreaking experience. If anybody has ever witnessed something like that, it, it's, I don't know if there's a word to just, there was anger, there was fear, there are so many things fast forward yet again, one year to the day before the littlest one, Fiona turned one year old. I adopted both baby girls and became a mother. The biological mother relinquished her rights and everything was peaceful and I became a mom. So my biggest dream in life, my everything I ever wanted with my first husband was given to me in a complete opposite way in which I thought I would get it. And that is the beauty within tragedy. I mean, you never know where things are going to come from, how they're, I never thought I was going to be a mother. I didn't think it was in the cards for me. And my brother, who is my best friend, gave me the biggest gift another human being could give another, which was give me his children, which are my babies now. And hence how I got into this line of work. I found purpose and power. I took leadership courses that lasted for four months at a time. I, I certifications in coaching, certifications in resiliency, studying positive psychology, really learning and harnessing this craft to teach people how to use their darkest moments to be their biggest PowerPoints because we can thrive. You know, we can thrive regardless of anything. You can survive anything if you believe in yourself. And once I felt that, once I understood that, that's when the career like really took form and opened up doors uh, to help other people do this. Wow. I I think this is the first time on this podcast TV show that I feel flawed and speechless, <laughs> Robin. <laughs> I'm just wiping away tears um, because, wow, what an amazing story. And you're so eloquent in sharing that. So, wow, thank you. I want to say thank you for all the work that you have done that allows you to be in the position that you're in. Because, yeah, particularly when you were talking about your niece, now your daughter, being in the NICU and just, yeah, no one would ever wish that on any unborn child, newborn child. So all of these things that you've been through and to hear you talk about them now, it's absolutely, utterly inspiring. So oh, thank, thank you, you so for sharing your beautiful story. Yes. And, and I guess, you know, a lot of people listening in might be probably feeling a little bit like me. So grab your own tissues right now and lean in people, because let's just talk a bit more about how, how you know, when we have these tragedies in our lives or these tough times in our lives, how is that beautiful? How, how do you find the beauty in that? Tell me more about that. I'm so glad that you asked this question because I get that a lot. I get people coming to me and they'll say things like there's no beauty in, you know, 
losing a limb and amputee. There's no beauty in losing a child. There's no beauty. And you're absolutely right. There is no beauty in the act. There's no beauty in the tragedy. It's tragic. And we get to take that into our soul. We get to understand and really digest what the occurrence is. And it doesn't have to be anything completely like, it doesn't have to be death, right? It doesn't have to be, it's whatever your relative occurrence is in your life that causes a sense of grief because grief is everywhere. It mm-hmm. happens all the time. Grief yeah. happens at the sale of a home that was your childhood home that you grew up in and you can't let go of that. And you're having, heart, that's grief. You're living in a state of grief. And we forget that a lot. We forget a lot about how much grief surrounds our life. And so in trying to understand what the beauty and tragedy means, it's give yourself grace for what you are living in, what you are living through, enjoy the lessons that you learn from it. You're not going to enjoy the pain. You're not going to enjoy the suffering, but those things are so imperative to how you are going to grow beyond yourself be larger than life. Without these things, we really can't understand the meaning of life and how fulfilling it is if we don't succumb to all the bad stuff that happens. You know, all this bad stuff is designed for us for a reason. I truly believe that. I believe that we are stronger than we think we are and what we're given gives us a purpose if we are able to shift our perspective on it. So just example, I'll use myself to help others kind of understand this beauty and tragedy. Losing seven babies was awful. I mean, it was just awful. There's no other word. It's horrific, but I got to feel what it was like to be pregnant. I got to have those moments of feeling a life grow inside me, having these moments of telling my parents, telling my husband's parents, telling our friends and family that we were pregnant. Those are things I'll never get. I'll I'll never get those things back, but I got to experience it. That's beautiful. I got to have that. And I choose to look at it in that perspective. I choose to change that narrative. I would rather have had that than to have never have had that. So it's just looking at, I would rather have had my husband and love him and get all these wonderful lessons from him than to have never have had him. The pain is worth worse. I'm sorry. The pain is worth the, what you go through to get to the beauty, because it's really just all about your perspective. And what do you believe that is your life? We're designing a new life. We're designing what we want and how we can create something. So when people come to me and say, there's no beauty in a child's death. Yes, I agree. There isn't, but would you have rather have had that child to love, to have those memories, to share those moments than to have never have had that child. Mm -hmm. I will say yes for myself. And that is what I want to give to people and to have people understand in the world of there can be beauty in everything. If we choose to give ourselves that gift, if we choose to really reflect and say, okay, yes, I can have that. And I can move forward with that and I can grow from that. And if I that is, I never want to live in vain of what somebody gave to my life. I never want my, I never want to be in vain of my husband. He taught me so much. I've loved, learned, grew. I know what I want in a relationship now, what I don't want in a relationship now, all of these things, you know, my first home, my, all of this. So I'm not going to live my life in vain of him because he's here. I'm going to grow beyond and take everything that he gave me. And I'm going to put that in my life. I'm going to put that out there and I'm going to live larger than I was living before because of it. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. I know that you said that you believe vulnerability and authenticity are really key in terms of us unlocking ourselves from our inner prison. So tell me about this inner prison and and how you broke free and how I guess how others can break free. Yes, the inner prison is something that 
we do this to ourselves. We get trapped inside of our bodies and trapped inside of our minds. And that comes from a lot of developmental things growing up in life. We have a lot of traumas that we go through. We have things that were taught to us that we don't necessarily understand until we get older. And then as we get older, we have a lot of blind spots in our life that why did I react a certain way? Why? from somewhere. Now, a lot of people have trauma that they live through. I did not have that growing up. So I love to use my life as an example to show how other people can find their perspective. And it's, you know, my father, wonderful, wonderful man. He would tell a story all the time about being in the army and how he would be in these rooms with these high up generals. And he wouldn't speak. He wouldn't say anything until the very end. And then he would say very poignant statement one very poignant statement. He was praised for this. I heard the story about a thousand times. So yes. wow, that's really great. Like, that's really cool. I heard all the army stories growing up. What I took from that was, okay, when I speak, I need to be intelligent. I need to be poignant. I need to be factual. I need to be all these things to be liked, loved, thought of in a certain way. He didn't teach me that. That's nothing he said. He never said that. That's how I took it. But my entire life, I trapped myself inside of my own head, my own being to not be free. I wouldn't speak in class sometimes because I was afraid I was going to say the wrong thing. When I went into business and started my first career, I always thought I had to be like, just like this all the time, you know, just, mm -hmm. I had to be professional. I couldn't say anything that was off-putting and that's trapping yourself. That's your inner prison. I'm not allowing myself to be me and all the mess that comes along with me. I'm a messy human being, but I used to not like that part. I would put this facade on and I didn't put a facade on to be fake. That's not how I felt, but I put a facade on to be respected. And really now that that's all gone, I'm a recovering perfectionist. Now that that's all gone, I can accept myself. I can be free with who I am. I don't have to listen to anybody or the judgment. And there's a lot of judgment. As you know, there's a lot of judgment in the world. Who cares? Mm -hmm. I'm free because I accept my imperfections. I don't want to be trapped inside myself. And I don't think that we stop to realize how much we trap ourselves inside of our own heads and our own being. So mm -hmm. being vulnerable, sharing a story, like what we just talked about. Sometimes like people will say, what's your story? I'll share it off the bat. And they're like, whoa, whoa, like they're uncomfortable by it and that's okay. But how much closer are we now that I shared this story, not knowing anything about, you know, anybody else that's going to hear it, but I'm bonded to another person. I'm bonded to you now. And when you do the same thing back to me, we form this level of connection. That's beyond the, how is the weather today? Exactly. You, mm -hmm. you grow, you grow deeper. So by being vulnerable, you're being you. You're accepting that you were given these gifts from whatever you believe. I believe in God. God gave me a gift in my life to be a human being. And with being a human being, I have emotions mm. and those emotions get to come out and I get to share them and we get to share back and forth. And that's how you unlock this inner, you unlock the door, you untrap yourself from your prison by just being you. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. And I, you know, we've all heard this just be you message, but I think you just articulate and explain that so well. And you're right, going back to what you said about, you know, as children, we come into the world being totally innocent and we all go through things. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've learned through the years is that children are great observers of situations, but often poor interpreters of situations, you know. And so it's like, you know, you spilt the milk on the floor and, and maybe mum cried out and said, Oh no, you spilt the milk. And perhaps mum was thinking, oh, no, I don't want you to get hurt because I just love you so much. And I don't want you to get cut on those, you know, that that glass that's broken. But in a child's mind, it can be, oh, no, I've spilt the milk. I've done it wrong. I'm useless. I'm no good. I'm not worthy. And so often we can trap ourselves with beliefs that we have about ourselves or about life that just don't serve us. So I love that. Um, that unique perspective because I haven't thought of it before in terms of vulnerability and authenticity you know combating that but I can absolutely see how that does you know I love the work with Brene Brown talking about you know for leaders for example the importance of being vulnerable and in, in the space that I work in a lot it's so important for leaders to be able to show up and actually take off the mask that I'm fine mask and say actually I feel 
really disconnected from my team right now with people spread out or you know I feel quite disheartened that we missed out on this opportunity or or I've just got a lot going on at the moment and I feel overwhelmed to actually be able to be vulnerable with our team members with our colleagues with our friends our family is so so powerful so I love that you brought that up because the strongest leaders are the ones that are able to do that they're the ones that are able to be like you know what I failed at this. I failed at this business. I failed at this perspective. I didn't open myself up to my team enough to hear you or take in business to better what we have going on around us. The ones that are the freest with themselves, meaning the most vulnerable, the most authentic are the ones that excel beyond measure because we're just being human. We're just being us. The ones, the leaders that take the approach of, no, I'm, I'm, I am strong of mine and strong of this. And I don't cry. Mm-hmm. Okay. You do. And it's, guess what? It's okay to, and it's actually better to cry that let it out. You're detoxifying your body. You're letting out so much bent up frustration that you're able to think clearer. Your mind opens up when you're able to attach to your emotions and to speak it. And that way, as a leader, as you said, you can connect with your team so much better by just saying, you know, I'm having a really bad day today and I need you guys to lift me up or this is not a good time in our company right now. We get to reflect on this because I want to learn from you. Those are the strongest leaders, the ones that can admit that they're human beings and can lead from the heart and balance that with the mind. Mm, Absolutely. Yeah. I'm very on board with what I call human centered leadership and, you know, realizing that people have People are human, living, breathing, emotional human beings. I know Brene Brown, again, she talks about how we sometimes think that we're logical beings with emotions from time to time, but really we're emotional beings with a little bit of logic from time to time. And I think when we tap into being able to acknowledge how we feel, that's so powerful. And just looking back to what you said before about grief being all around us. I think, you know, we are recording this in 2022. And so we're, you know, it's been a last two and a half years of us dealing with this global pandemic and people have had to grieve the loss of so many things, whether it's personal freedoms, canceled events and birthday parties and you know, uncertainty in work and job losses and income loss and just, just the plethora of all of the things we've had to grieve is so great. Yeah. I know that you said that grief is actually really necessary to building resilience, which I think has become such a key word at the moment. So can you just explain that connection? between grief and resilience building. Absolutely. So resilience can be taught. People think that you're born with resilience or that you're born being a positive person. And I would love to take a second just to say being a positive person doesn't mean you're putting on this, I call a fakety fake life, right? You're not being just yeah, I'm happy and fine. That's not what it's all about. Mm -hmm. It's actually grounded. It's grounded in optimism. It's grounded in trainings that you can do looking up to role models, looking to your environment. You study positivity and resiliency. So it is learned. Now there's also things and we could go into five other shows about genetics and epigenetics and things that create resiliency and things like that. But our environment shapes resiliency to what goes on in the world, like the pandemic, this shapes how we maneuver situations and how we're able to understand what resiliency means. So as we go through a circumstance, let's say because of the pandemic, we lost a lot of people. A lot of people were grieving the loss of, of their families and friends. So going through a grief in that first initial year, it's the toughest. It's the hardest. You're maneuvering through emotions that you possibly have never experienced before. Now, just because that's the hardest year doesn't mean that's the only year, because as the years go on, you're going to learn how to transition into your next phase of becoming resilient. So as you are understanding grief, realize that this is something that life is giving you because you will grow from it. You will grow beyond it. It will be something that will make your mind stronger. It will make your body stronger. Everything is connected. So By living in grief versus pushing it away, people want to compartmentalize things. We want to put it in a box, tie it with a bow and say, all right, that's it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. 
I'm fine. That's that fakety fake life. You're not fine. Mm -hmm. So by digesting grief, every emotion, whether that's your ugly crying in the floor on your kitchen, and you are understanding what it feels like to feel that loss, that pain, that grief that you feel is directly connected to the amount of love that you had for that person. So by feeling it, you're just becoming resilient just from feeling by not pushing it away. So grow through each emotion and take that in as life has given me this. Now, what am I going to stay down? Am I going to not get up again? And am I not going to start my life again? If that's the case, then that's a different route you get to take. You get to understand what medical treatment looks like and clinicians and things like that. In a, in a very specific way, because we get stuck in complex grief and complex trauma, and that takes a long time. If we're the type of human being that, okay, I know that I'm going to move beyond this, take each day as it comes, take each stepping stone, each lesson, set a goal for yourself every single day to get out of bed. That's a goal to take a shower that's a goal to step outside and sit in the sunlight. That's a goal. People don't think about the small little transitions of life that will help us understand why grief is necessary. Because if our world, if we had a birthday party every day, that's fun. Okay. That's fun. But what else are we doing? What else are we learning? How are we growing together and connecting? We're just celebrating something forever without ever feeling another emotion that's going to lift us up higher than we were before. That's going to expand our mind and evolve our being into growing. So that's why I say grief and suffering are necessary because it sets new purpose. It sets new intention. It sets new career paths, and it allows you to understand who you are, who you're meant to be, and where you can go from here. Wow. That's, you just articulate that so well, Robin. And I love that because I feel like it is a real encouragement for those of us that are going through grief to realize as we go through it, as we lean, I call it leaning into it, as we lean into it and allow those feelings to be there, to actually know right now I am building resilience as I do that. I know Last year, I actually connected with a coach and counsellor because I really was noticing I wasn't dealing well with grief or I lost a loved one who ended their own life. And that just, it was just, you know, that painful sense of being left behind, which a lot of people have experienced. And I found that I wasn't really processing it. And, and it was so simple what she pointed out to me, which was that I just needed to really spend time attending to it. And actually focusing on it rather than trying to ignore it and not think about it. And yeah, it was a really, I mean, I'm still on that journey, I think, but it was an amazing process of just spending time leaning into it. And, and even though like, like you and I are probably similar in lots of ways, when you've done lots of professional development, lots of personal development, and you know, you're a qualified coach and all these things, you still can't coach yourself. So it's always enlightening to have somebody show up and So this is really, you know, where you need to spend some time. So always, always a coach needs coaching, right? A coach needs therapy, a coach, you know, I love therapy. I love therapy. It's great. You know, you learn things about yourself that like, oh, wow, I didn't think of it in that perspective too. Like I will always tell somebody, you know, therapy is a great thing. A coach is a great thing, but we too, I'm a resiliency strategist. This is what I study all the time. I, I get to talk you don't figure. And I have days too, that I I'm a mess, you know, I'm, and I'm designed to be a mess that way. My Mm -hmm. grief journey will be forever as we discussed. And it's not all about being like, I've got it all together. I don't have it all together. Mm -hmm. I have it together in the place that I'm in right now, but then there's days like on the anniversary of my brother's passing or on the anniversary of my husband's passing or whatever it is, you know, I, I give myself space that day. And I learn to lean into whatever it is that I'm feeling. And then I start to journal about it because there's new emotions that come up. A new, another year has gone by. I write things down to, to relieve that stress. And then I go back and look at that journaling and I say, okay, this is different than last year, or this is different than three weeks ago. What am I, what am I developing now? What am I discovering now? So it's a constant 
work in progress to educate yourself, which in turn helps educate others too. You become an educator when you live in grief too. You help other people and advocate for them when they don't know what to do or where to go in that state as well. Yeah, so encouraging. Uh, I really like what you mentioned about the writing because my last question, I just wanted to ask you if we could dive into practical strategies or ideas you know if it was somebody's listening in right now and they are either going through grief right now or they realize that they are or perhaps they're currently going through trauma or have past trauma what are you know maybe two or three just practical ideas of things you'd recommend that people can do to help work through it journaling is one of the best things that you can do for yourself. And this is journaling in a traditional notebook, not on the computer. Cause what we do is, and I, I don't think that people sometimes always know the science behind journaling. It's become very popular now, but when we journal, when we handwrite things, we're actually alleviating stress that's inside of our body. So we're connecting our brain to our hand, to the paper, and we are releasing as we write. And so there is a cathartic nature to it. There's a science behind it. And I call it just word vomit, excuse if that sounds bad, but you don't have to have anything to say. Just say whatever it is that you're feeling. You're angry, you're mad, you are so upset, you're sad, you're depressed, it's black. I also like to do a color association with your feelings as well. So as you're journaling, think of, you know, okay, today I feel gray or today I feel yellow. Like the sun's out, I may feel yellow. It gives us a sense of, okay, you know, I can be lively. I can be dark. I can be the rainbow, but today I feel this way and pattern that pattern, this color discovery, your color wheel and see, am I having more gray days than I'm having yellow, orange, or blue, whatever that means to you see that and, and really process as you go your journey. So journey feelings, and then do something every day that may be a little different than what you did the previous day. And like I said, if you're in that first initial stage of grief where it is like, I can't see beyond myself, it really is, I'm gonna go outside and I'm gonna sit outside for 10 minutes. Set small goals, tiny goals that just show that you did something because when we move forward, we're telling our body that we can be here in this life and that we can survive, that we are survivors. And then the last tip that I'll give is shifting the narrative And it's called positive reappraisal. So what that does is if you're in a bad situation, how can I turn the situation around? Because the situation's not going to change. So how can I turn the situation around to make it benefit me? So I'll give an example of that really quickly as well. If I've I'm in the airport, my flight's delayed and I'm not going to get home. I have to stay another night. I'm mad about this. I'm just annoyed and frustrated. Well, okay. What didn't I get to do while I was here that I can now go do see that friend. I didn't get to go see, go to that dinner that I wanted to go at the restaurant, go back to my hotel and take a bath and relax. Anything can be shifted in our brain. If we learn how to positively reappraise something and then change that narrative. So it benefits us. I'm feeling depressed today. I don't want to get off this couch. Okay. Well, I don't want to get off this couch. But what is something that's going to benefit me to get off this couch? I'm going to go fix myself a salad that's going to nourish my body in a healthy way. And I'm going to go sit back down on the couch. So something that's called positive reappraisal. There's, there's a whole psychology behind yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. But change the narrative in our brain. Yeah, I love that. And that does look back to what you said at the start. Our narrative and the story we tell ourselves about how and why things happen, it just creates such a change doesn't it so thank you so much Robin I just love everything that you've shared thank you for your vulnerability and demonstrating that thank you for all the practical tips I know that people have got so much out of that so if people wanted to find out more about you what's the best place they can connect with you yeah. So you can go to, um, robin.l4 live in life, love and life.com. That's my website. You can also find me on Instagram at Robin Gargano L4. I'm on Facebook too. I've got a live in life, love and life page and a group. So those are my main social. I'm also on LinkedIn. Yes, I am. I'm on LinkedIn as well. So I've got those three social media platforms and then my website and you can contact me, please message me. I, I love hearing from people, send me a little direct 
private messages and Instagram and connect, just please connect and reach out. If anybody is suffering through something and they want to share it, please do, because it's in those moments that we really do learn from one another and can grow together. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Robin. And if you haven't already, if you're listening into the podcast, do make sure you head to thrivetvshow.com and all of the links will be down below in the show notes so you can link through and connect with Robin. It's really kind of you. So just to close, can I ask you one final question? And that is just, if there's one more thing you want to share with our listeners and viewers today, what would that be, Robin? Don't be afraid of where you are in life right now. If you feel trapped, if you feel like there is no hope, don't be afraid of it. Look at it as a stepping stone to your next great possibility. You are stronger than you think you are. You will grow further beyond where you're at right now, but don't be afraid of it. Lean into it, grow through it, evolve from it, and then help and serve the world because of it. You'll have due purpose again, but never be afraid of where you're at and who you are because it's beautiful in all its messiness. Mm, thank you so much I just feel like this whole episode is like balm to our souls so thank you so much Robin oh thank you so much Lauren this was amazing I really enjoyed being here today so thank you for everyone that's tuned in that's another episode of the Thrive TV show go out and thrive thank you for listening to the Thrive TV show with Lauren Parsons Visit ThriveTVShow.com to access the show notes and discover our fantastic bonus content. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspiring episode.